When writing sermon titles a couple months ahead, it is always good to make them broad and vague enough that on the week of actually preaching the sermon, you can pick the direction you want to go specifically. There's not much broader question than the questions I'm going to be asking the next three weeks. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Today I'm going to focus on where did we come from? And there's many places to go with this. I could give a sermon about Michigan, because I come from Michigan, and, <laughs> and the Michigan ganders in here know each other. And, but I thought maybe I should go back a little farther than that. And, and so I, 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 someone suggested perhaps under a cabbage patch, but I, was, uh, but, I, <laughs> but I was told that when a mommy and daddy love each other very much, but I didn't want to go into that sermon. Thing. <laughs> and then, you know, then there's the, just the or, origin of life and coming from some slime on the edge of some golden pond, you know, that we, where we were once amoebas. And, and I wanted to go even farther back than that. And there's all the myths of things in ancient times, of the Babylonian myths of the slaying of the dragon Tiamat and the dead carcass arose all the earth. And there's other stories um, from... Africa, where the sun and moon were born to the great mother, and then every time there was an eclipse, more gods were born, representing different forms of nature. And there are many, many interesting myths and stories about where we came from. And when it came down to it, I settled on two two stories that are probably the most familiar to us. The story of evolution and the story of creation found in Genesis 1. Now Genesis contains two creations, one in Genesis 1 and leaking a little bit into the second chapter, and then the second creation story, which is the Garden of Eden story, which finishes up Genesis 2. I'm going to read a free translation or a paraphrase of Genesis 1 using words that perhaps our scientists in our community might feel more welcome with. <laughs> in the beginning, synergy created the sky and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of synergy moved on the face of the waters. And synergy sounded. Let there be light, and there was light. And synergy responded to the light, and it was good. And synergy divided the light from the darkness, and synergy distinguished the light as day, and the darkness it distinguished as night. And evening and the morning were the first era. And synergy sounded. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from waters. And synergy made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And synergy distinguished the firmament as the sky, and evening and the morning were the second era. And synergy sounded. Let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let dry land appear, and it was so. And synergy distinguished the dry land as earth, and the gathering together of the waters made the seas, and synergy responded that it was good. And synergy sounded. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, 
whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind. And Synergy responded that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third era. And Synergy sounded. Let there be lights in the firmament, in the sky, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days, and for years. And let them be lights in the firmament of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Synergy made two great lights, a greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night, making the stars also. And Synergy set them in the firmament of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to divide light from darkness. And Synergy responded that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth era. And Synergy sounded, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the sky. And Synergy created the great whales and every living creature that moves with which the water brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after its kind. And Synergy responded, it was good. And Synergy blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning of the fifth era and synergy sounded let the earth bring forth creature every living creature after its kind cattle and creeping thing the beast of the earth after its kind and it was so and synergy made the beast of the earth after its kind synergy saw that it was good and synergy sounded let us make humans in our own image after our own likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea or over the fowl of the air over the cattle of the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and so synergy created humanity in its own image in the image of synergy created them male and female created them and synergy blessed them Synergy sounded unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And synergy sounded, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree, which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. For you it shall be for meat. And synergy responded to every good thing that was made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth era. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, synergy ended the work which it had made. You may have noticed some changes from the familiar <laughs> text. First and foremost, I changed the word God to the word synergy. Now this was not completely random because the Hebrew word for God is Elohim and this is the plural for the word for strength. Strength or power or energy. Plural of energy, energies working together is synergy. Synergy is a name for God stripped of the mythological personification. Rather than conceiving God as a male person, as I have on my tie, <laughs> Synergy conceives of God as all the powers of the universe working in combination. This being is not inanimate, for it is energy and motion itself. However, it's not a he or a she or an it. It's not an animal with a gender. It does not possess the organs of procreation. It is creative energy itself. 
Thus, for the rest of the story, I remove those pronouns, specific pronouns of he and she. And I also changed some of the anthropomorphic references. God said became synergy sounded. The, energy, the universe was void and without form, a singularity, a black hole, until the Big Bang. Synergy sounded indeed. God saw became synergy responded. It denotes an interaction with the environment, but it's not dependent upon eyeballs. <laughs> God called the light day becomes synergy distinguished the light as day. The need for things to be called as we call and name things only arises after the Big Bang when things become distinguished one from another and things were separating at a rapid rate. And another word that I changed was the Hebrew word yom. In this passage, it's generally translated as day. But other places in the Bible, it's translated as a more generic word for time in general. So here I've translated it as era. This gives us some latitude. The creative period is not limited to six days, literal days. I did this exercise to highlight that there may be some harmony between evolution and Genesis 1. These are the two major creation stories in the Western world. And they have their points of agreement. I believe the first chapter of Genesis has more in common with evolution than it has with the second chapter of Genesis. Evolution and Genesis 1 both start with a universal void, and then there's an explosion of light. Genesis 2 story starts with a mist over the face of the earth very different. In Genesis 1 and evolution, the development of life follows a similar pattern. Plant life, then animals, then humans. Genesis 2 has man created, the male of the species, then the plants, <laughs> then the animals, and then the female of the species. <laughs> it's very different from evolution. But even when we expand our understanding of scripture, even if we uncover these hidden meanings, the scientific and the theological explanation of our beginning is not the same. For the biblical story has a sense of intention. God, synergy, intended to create the universe and did. A scientific explanation limits itself to what happened and does not ask why. And perhaps that is why many still seek a religious explanation. Is there a reason we are here? Where did we come from? Are we special? Well, Genesis 1 says we are pretty special, created in the image of God. That puts humanity pretty high up in the rankings. Where in evolution, we are just another species among many. Perhaps dolphins are the dominant species on our planet. Perhaps they are the ones that should take over. <laughs> they may be wiser. How important is it to you that you be special as a human being? Does the origin story need to point to your uniqueness, your particular 
reason for being here. The first chapter of Genesis also has judgment. Synergy or God declares that creation is good. This is a, a moral assertion. It is a positive affirmation of our existence. I find it strange that this has not been the dominant theme in Christianity. Often this world is disparaged as believers seek life after death. The belief in a heavenly home makes many not care about this earthly home. But yet, in that creation story, it's the seeds of saying that what we are involved in now is inherently good. Evolution, on the other hand, does not judge whether creation is good or bad. Things are just as they are. If you adapt, you survive. Things are as they should be, otherwise they wouldn't be. I sometimes wonder whether the greater miracle is to be here by chance. Despite all the other possible outcomes on all the other possible worlds, we are here. We have beaten the odds. And that in itself is pretty special. I don't think that accidental existence is less special than being part of a plan. The Genesis story tells us that we are intentional and good. The evolution story tells us that we are accidental <coughs> and neutral. But neither story really tells us why we are here. Even the creation story, which says God wanted to create us, doesn't say why. Were we created to see if we could get to heaven? <laughs> well, if that's the reason, then God failed. <laughs> because because the system set up by most religions has most people not making it to heaven. <laughs> and that runs across a lot of religions, not, not just Christianity. Now, if we presume with the universalists in our tradition that all would be reunited with God, that still doesn't answer the question why we would be separated in the first place. Another distinction between Genesis and evolution is the notion that God rested, that creation is over. The use of synergy as a name for God breaks down at this point. Is God stopped? Is God still resting? If creation is an event of the past, then it's static. It can't be synergy. We are just items in a collection of God, pawns in an eternal plan. There's little choice but to submit to the will of God. Evolution and the inexorable laws of science can be just as much a cruel dictator as any god created by any religion. Gravity is going to exist and it's going to get you <laughs> every time you try to defy it. Just as certain as some people believe you're going to be gotten if you defy other laws of God. But evolution, evolution suggest that improvement is still possible, that creation did not stop, that if God rested, he got up the next Monday and started again. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And that change, that evolving, may be the purpose that comes from where we came from. We are here to adapt to what is. Next week, I'll be talking more about the why are we here, but maybe our beginning tells us a, has a clue that we are here to interact with the world and each other. We are part of the order of things. And that's where I come back to that idea of God as synergy, energy reacting to energy. There's a stream of theology called process theology, where change reacting to change, humanity being co-creators with God, God itself evolving. God's reason for being would be the same as ours. We evolve to evolve some more. The answer to why we are living is in the living itself. Whether we come from the mind of God or a mindless process is not as important as recognizing that we are the products of change. Because if we were created by the Big Bang, the theist would ask, well, then what created the Big Bang? If we were created by God, the humanist would ask, well, then what created God? Mystery, mystery, mystery. We are a puzzle and a mystery. There is an infinity behind each the scientific and the Judeo-Christian story that is beyond our understanding. And this infinity is really behind almost any myth. You read the myths from around the world, and it, they all come back to, this doesn't really tell me where we came from. <laughs> I heard a story about an American scientist who believed in evolution, and he was talking to a, a Native American audience, and a man stood up and said, this isn't true. The earth rests on the back of a turtle. And the scientist laughed with his obvious Western superiority, and he said, well, what does the turtle stand on? And the native replied, the earth. And then he laughs some more. And then what does that earth rest on? A turtle. <laughs> that makes no sense. You have to run out of turtles sometime. <laughs> he said, no, there are turtles all the way down. <laughs> the turtles all the way down. It's just another term for the infinity. We came from something infinite beyond our understanding. We come from a process that started long ago. And we are products of change and thus should be open to change. So I'm hoping that the microphone works. Hello, is it still on? Is this on? I didn't check with him before the service. Is on? All right, great. Enough of my ramblings. <laughs> I'm sure you have ramblings and thoughts of your own. <laughs> um, this is the International Year of Astronomy, and there's a podcast called 365 Days of Astronomy, and I've been listening to it this year. And frequently, there will be scientists involved in X-ray research and uh, radio telescope research. And they talk about looking into the universe for the Big Bang. And every single time I hear one of these things, it, the whole creation myth just runs through my head because these, they're looking at the creation of the universe and the evolution of the universe. And many of these scientists are very, are, are people of faith. 
and they don't see any kind of disconnect between their investigation of the science, the, the why, the how, and their faith. Uh, and, and I find it really remarkable um, and enjoyable and just mind expanding truly because these people spend their lives looking at you know the x-rays going through the universe trying to figure out what happened in the Big Bang. And, and what, what's the site again? It's probably 365 days of astronomy.org is the podcast. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's like 15 minutes a day. Oh, good. I think it's kind of interesting that you have creation myth that have some point in common, like you were saying, and yet you have like Greek mythology where you have all these Greek gods, like um, the earth rested upon the shoulders of, um, I'm sorry, I think of the Atlas, yeah. So you have all these interesting variations on the same thing, and each culture seems to have their own idea of how we came to be. And that sort of thing, and the oral tradition. And but it's a po there seems to be one point in common that we all find into a system in some fashion, seemingly that in fashion, you know, like up. It started. Yeah, it started with the bang. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that she said they had the sense that throughout the different myths that they things somehow started. And that, that seems to be really hardwired into our consciousness. And she also mentioned that Atlas carried the world on his shoulders. And so perhaps Atlas was a turtle. <laughs> uh, I, uh, coincidentally, yesterday I saw Religious. Uh, the film Religious that Bill Maher did. If you have not seen it, I recommend it highly because one of the things he does, which just fits in so perfectly today, is talk about all of the different creation stories and how similar they are all over. Hi there. Uh, Jackie Mason, the comedian and rabbi, uh, addressed that question, why are we here? And being a good rabbi, he posed the question with another question. The question is, well, why do we dance? And the reason we dance is we dance to have fun. I like that answer. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, the way that people usually conceive of the creation stories, in some sense a grab, bag of, a grab bag of the two Genesis stories, and that people like the sort of opening uh, sort of simplicity and, and purity of God separating the light and the dark and the sort of aloof God, and they also like Adam and Eve, but there's little details that they uh, tend to sort of not emphasize as much. For example, in the second version, God is just sort of wandering around and he brings people to life by breathing into their nostrils. And I think that that's the kind of aspect of religion that people uh, are very sort of dependent on, the sense of a, a God who's sort of personal and he's going to uh, attend to you uh, as an individual and breathe into your nose. And uh, in a sense, that's, I think, why people are committed to uh, Genesis as a whole, is because it provides them with both things in a way that uh, evolution doesn't quite. And that seems to be sort of the, the extra, the, the surplus or the little bit extra that people are most interested in. I think that one thing in common to all these explanations, scientific, which you describe so interestingly, and you describe interestingly, uh, is that both express or show the re responses we make to our desire to understand. And it occurs to me that behind the understanding, we always find more difficulties. The uh, traditional religions have themselves come up with the fundamental problem of evil going all the way back to the book of Job. And the uh, scientific search for understanding always leads to more questions about how did that, how are we to fully to understand that? And now we've got theories that only mathematicians can really understand. And I think the real enemy of understanding is when we stop and find certitude anywhere. 
And I think that understanding reaches somehow deeper than the particular answers that we settle for. Um, could we see a subtext in this story? Um, energy in and of itself is not really that interesting. It's what you do with it that counts. <laughs> answer your question of why God made humans, if you go back to James Weldon Johnson, he says very clearly, God stepped out on space, looked around and said, I'm lonely. I think I'll make me a world. So maybe God just needs community. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope this community will continue to discuss these questions because I think they pull at us in a way that's even more important than any particular answer we get. It, it expresses a human longing for understanding. I often dislike rewriting hymns. I remember when I was in seminary, we were in the middle of inclusive language and wanting to make our languages um, in our hymns include both men and women and so there was a group that about the year before I came to seminary went through the Presbyterian hymn book and penciled in corrections <laughs> and they were god-awful from a point of a musician because he had songs like good Christian folk rejoice <laughs> which just kind of stuck in my throat like a horrible 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 uh, desecration this, this next hymn, which I liked in this Christian form, where it said, Lord of all, to thee we raise, is I think one of the few changes and editing of a hymn that actually works poetically and theologically and philosophically. And it's a very rare thing indeed. So please rise as you're able and sing with gusto to the source of all. <laughs> Please join me in reading the words of offering uh, printed in your order of service. 
We come from many places to gather in community. May our gifts serve to make this place a sanctuary for all who need comfort and courage. Our offertory music will be Nettleton, arranged by Greer.